we're now going to have um, a bit of a Q&A session, and I'm going to hand over to Simon, who's going to facilitate that. Um, I, I'm going to just ask a couple of questions that I would like each each of the um, <coughs> presenters to consider. Uh, first, firstly, I, I was fascinated by this um, uh, mention from from the uh, from the presentation um, by Fatih from 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 Ghana of the. The fact that uh, it was said that there was a diversity of land, uh, traditional land governance, um, and that this diversity provides options for what could be a that's a replication of uh, improvements in land governance uh, uh, in terms of of women's access and particularly uh, gender equality in the way that decisions were made. So, from from my from my uh, understanding of, of that, this. If, if, if there is a diversity of models in, in traditional land governments al already operating, perhaps there's the possibility to identify which of those then uh, are, are are better for in, for for enabling better gender equality and also uh, enabling women's rights. So perhaps uh, if others, uh, if, if Fati and, uh, could could explain exactly what the diversity of uh, of, of land governance, traditional land governance, uh, how, how, how that uh, is expressed and how, how we see that and also what kind of options that uh, that, that provides. That would be very interesting. The, the, the other question I had um, is around um, changing customary practices. And in your experience, how do um, societies react to uh, to groups of women seeking to change those 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 customary practices, and do 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 the women's groups that you're you're working with, um, do they have to negotiate the right to be able to uh, propose those changes to customary practice practices? Um, perhaps uh, what uh, the if we could if we could start with 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 Fati. Uh, and then, and then go to Mary, and then to Mamadou. All right. Thank you very much, and uh, I want to say well done to all uh, the presenters as well, Mary and Mamadou. Um, to the first question about the diversity uh, of land laws relating to land governance in Ghana. Uh, in, in Ghana, we have two uh, types of even with uh, customary. Even, we have two types of customary practices, even in the land governance. We have the matri matrilineal and we have got the patrilineal. In the part that I work in, in Northern Ghana, we have patri patrilineal inheritance. And so most of the issues is always surrounding all the men. In Southern Ghana, and particularly not in almost all of them, but uh, most of the, the practices are matrilineal especially in the Ashanti Kingdom. In, East, in the eastern region of Ghana, they practice the matrilineal system. And other parts, like the Volta region of Ghana, they practice the patrilineal system. And so we have got even these systems within the customary practice that affects women one way or the other. And I'm saying the diversity uh, of these practices could be uh, an entry point for all of us. Because if you are going to... Um, in a way, replicate what the work that we have done in Northern Region. We are within the patrilineal system. And so if you are coming into Southern Ghana to undertake such, or to replicate the model of the CLDC, you will have to understand the customs and the traditions and the practices of the people within the area to be able to implement. If not, you could be running into trouble with the communities because they have different practices. But we have the same issues when it comes to women's land rights and women in land governance. Even in the, in, the, in, in the National House of Chiefs, the women, our women chiefs who are part of our traditional uh, system don't even have much say at the National House of Chiefs. There's a lot of work that is ongoing currently by gender advocates or women, women's rights advocates to get the women, get them seats, get them voices within the uh, the traditional council, that the, the national house of chiefs, but it's a little difficult. That is because the systems that 
rural, most of these things are quite diverse. And so when you, are, when you are trying to bring all these things together, there's a lot of work that you have to do, a lot of consultations that you need to do to bring people to the table to understand the need for women to be in these spaces. Now, on, the, on changing the customary practice and, and how we seek to change this, we will be able to change this thing through advocacy. Now, customs and traditions are not static. They change. And so you use the best practices in other places, use it as an example in the area that you want to seek the change from or the change in, and then you get them to understand. For instance, when I was going, we were going to do the model tenancy agreement, it was very difficult to get even the women who had learned from their husbands to say, okay, I'm going to enter into a tenancy agreement with my husband. Even if it is a gift, he has to write it in the agreement that it is a gift that he's given to me that I can use forever. But then we had to use other systems that are other practices within the sardin sector to show to them that even men do seed land to their wives and it is documented. And so documenting a piece of land and seeding it to your wife is not a myth. It's not a mystery. It's not something that will make you less manly. And so with all these discussions on the table, the men sometimes, they, they try to understand. In fact, they understand. And changes are taking place. Uh, when we started this program, like Mary said, women don't even enter the chief's palace except on rare occasions. But then when we started, when the program started going on, we started talking to them and we told them there was need for women to be around the table for discussion. Women could even call for a meeting in the chief's palace. So these are some of the changes and we hope that if these discussions continue, we are likely to change all these negative practices that affect women. And whether women need to negotiate their rights it depends on the level of the woman's understanding of her own rights. The fear is that some people might not even understand the premise of their own right and could begin an advocacy that could backfire on they themselves. So it is very, very important for us to continue with the education, sensitizing, creating awareness in our communities on women's rights generally, and then we can then zero it down to land governance and ensuring that women also got themselves involved in the decisions around land. Thank, thank you very much. Um, Mary, would you like to respond to, to, to either or, or both of those two questions? Uh, really, I think Fatih have, uh, have responded quite well, but I think I would like to say uh, in bridging the gap between uh, the law and the practice in order to realize gender equality, especially in issues related to land governance and uh, village or local communities governance uh, in general, we should facilitate or um, we should facilitate development of uh, local solutions, which uh, will will enable the local community to 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 to, to do away with the challenges uh, related to to gender inequality. We should also understand that communities are not homogeneous. That being the case, we should work uh, in each community in a way uh, in and the proposal or facilitate the development of tools or solutions which will fit in their context and uh, we should also facilitate consultations and dialogues for sustainability of any developed uh, tool or, uh, or, or um, uh, solution to enhance women voices and control over their livelihood uh, options because we understand with the male uh, uh, we, uh, with the women, uh, men dominated communities, our, our work should not at the end of the day make these women more vulnerable, but we should facilitate uh, a, um, a, an environment where these women gradually will be, uh, will be, uh, will be um, able to, particip uh, to participate in these, in these uh, kind of, uh, of uh, initiatives which we are, we are talking about. Thank you. Uh, Amadou. And can you enlighten us from, from, from your Senegalese experience with regards to uh, the diversity of traditional land governance and, and also uh, the rights that people um, have to, to change uh, customary practices? The, the key 
or the most relevant answer regarding that for the Senegalese, in the Senegalese perspective is a lack of training and information because the new land law uh, setting in 1964 tried to, to eliminate all the customary land law, but uh, this kind of practice continues to to be there and to to drive the process of land governance. I, I talk about the lack of training and information because it is very important, it is very relevant when we talk about the land law. The deficiency in training and education concerns both the women and the rural councillor. And even though so women are aware of the existence of law, the fact remains that this knowledge is still superficial. It cannot be otherwise when one knows that over 18% of these women are illiterate. For example, during the process, none of the most important women met knew that the law entitled them to attend rural council deliberation. They don't know the way to access to, to learn. They just consider the fact that they must access to learn through their family through heritage or by purchase. But the lack of resource don't allow them to, to purchase land. So they just access to land by rural council deliberation. And in general, women are not aware of the importance of rural council. They they don't know they women don't know the prerogative, especially within the framework of, of decentralization. And it may be for this major reason that the rural council is not considered by them as a very important body. So maybe they justified it by the low, not representative, but a low leadership of women present in the decision making process or in the decision making body. And the, the, the woman interviewed during this process did not take any action to fight evil the better representative of a rural council or to see to the implementation of the pro provision of the law relative to the national domain. So that is maybe maybe one one entry point which could be maybe improve the knowledge of uh, law and the implementation of the modern law because we have the modern law as the customary land law still here uh, at the few, at the very few, uh, no, present and at the local level, but not recognized by state. And during the last, the last land reform, people worked to take into account the customary land law. But it was very difficult to bring the decision maker to take into account the customary land law because we could see some practice which not what which will which which not allowed women to be comfortable with the land the land access. So that is a, a an answer that I could a reflection that I have uh, with this two kind of of uh, law the customary land law and the modern land law. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we do have a couple of questions in, in the, in, that have been posted. One is from Josephine Robinet. The um, person is asking um, about examples from the experiences of the presenters where, whereby women have gained access to land and have grown products that they have then, they themselves have then been able to sell or to trade um, and and asking particularly whether the women producers are able to set the terms of trade and, and the conditions of sale in, in, in terms that are fair to them. So perhaps uh, if the presenters can, uh, if you have experiences where women have gained land and then been able to, get to, to achieve fair trade of the products of, of that land. Um, maybe I would like to start uh, responding to uh, the question from uh, Josephine. I would like to say uh, for the case of Kisarawa, we have, I have mentioned that uh, 
some of women have been allocated land by the village government and uh, that allocation uh, has been made to them as individuals. Uh, they are using that land to produce crops for, to sustain themselves and for, uh, for, for economic gain, but in any case, if they would like to transfer those properties, they are under the law, they are in a position to transfer the property and negotiate the sale and transfer the process. However, the, the, the transferring process is under, uh, is, is provided under, under, under the land laws. So, uh, after being allocated, you have a right to transfer the, uh, the land is, uh, in a manner which you prefer, as long as you are within uh, the ambit of of the law. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think the question was both referring to uh, the land as a resource that, or as that asset that's transferred to women, but also the, prod the products from that land. So perhaps uh, Fatih or Mamadou, you have examples where, where that, uh, that chain of positive events, land transfer or land access and then production and trading on, on fair terms. Do you have examples that you can you can tell us about of, of those? I would like to respond to Josephine's um, listen about women's rights, land uh, land rights, how where women have gained access to land and whether they have been able to sell the products that they produce themselves. Yes, um, in our uh, in our work, our women have been able to access land from the traditional authority. Some of them have been given land as group as a group. Uh, to protect the women from any other man coming to pick the land or to uh, cultivate the land on behalf of his wife and claim the land is his. So the land is given to the women as a group with their group name and everything on that uh, tenancy agreement. There are women who also have access land from their husbands, from their brothers, from their families, from their siblings, or from other sources. These women are able to produce and they are able to use the resources that they get from the produce on their land to maintain their families. In fact, um, we, we, we all know most of the times when women have any uh, incomes, it goes into family uh, support. And this is how the women actually use their resources. They have a right to sell the land, them, they produce themselves. They do their own marketing. They have their own prices depending on the market uh, at, their, at, at that given time, and they are able to sell it themselves and make money. And so, for get, getting the land is just if if you have to transfer the land to another person, it will depend on the contract that you had or the agreement that you had with the person who gave you the land. If you take a ten-acre land and you cannot cultivate the whole ten-acre land, and you have to pass that land to someone, then you will need to get back to the landlord or to the landowner and let the person understand that there's going to be a new person working on two more, on, on the two acres or the three acres that you are not able to cultivate to uh, prevent any misunderstandings and any assumption that you want to take control totally of the land, irrespective of the uh, presence of the landowner. I'm happy to make actually sort of general comment on, on the question, um, which is a very important one, uh, which is the, I guess, the link uh, between women's formal access to land and, and women's economic empowerment. The question, of course, goes sort of beyond the scope of, of, of this project. Um, so, although I don't have any sort of hard we haven't been focusing on that, and there's, there hasn't been any sort of uh, rigorous research done on that. And I think this is very much something that should be looked into. Uh, my understanding is that there is anecdotal evidence, and I'm thinking of um, Tanzania, but I think potentially in, in, in Ghana and Senegal, uh, there is anecdotal evidence that women are more likely to get the proceeds of the um, of the crops that they're cultivating and selling when they have formal access to land through uh, whether it's an individual title or a group title or a joint title with their husband rather than when they access land informally 
to their husbands. Uh, but I think there sh this is something that should be looked into more um, more rigor rigorously, and I would be really interested to see um, a study on, on that. Thank you, Philippine. Mamadou, would you like to add add an example that, that illustrates this, this issue of access to land and then a fairer, fairer terms of trade for women? Uh, yeah, I, I just would like to to share the fact that uh, normally purchased land is forbidden by the law. But uh, women, yes, they go through the purchase for access to land because they don't have the possibility to access to land when we use right. They have the right to, to access to the land regarding the law, but in practice, when you go to the field, it is difficult for them to access to the land because the cultural a process or the customer land row don't give them enough space for them to access to the land. They are just a member of a family and it's it's a concern for them. But now they try to to organize them, themselves through their own organization to access to the land. Because, uh, local, govern, local governments could give them the land if there are numerous women uh, organizing has a an interesting group. Uh, in this case, they could access to the land, but individually, it is really it is still difficult for them to access to the land if they would like to work themselves for the land. Except if there are a chief of family, um, the woman who lost their husband could be access to the land because they are just considered as the chief of family. They are facility. They are easy for them to access to the land. But if they just come as a member of a family to, 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 to submit a demand for land, it is still difficult for them to, to access the land. And that's why they try to, 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 to purchase land, good land for them to, to implement their activity or to develop their own activity. But now we try to assist to the development of paralegals uh, regarding the issues of, of land. A lot of women would like to, to be trained as a paralegals in order to sensitize the other women and to organize themselves to be a very strong group of, of actors who could engage the conversation with the men and with the decision maker. And it's try to, to bring some change. And in this framework of this experience, we are, we are working, we are setting up a national platform, bringing all the NGO working on the on the land issues in order to have a very strong alliance, which will end over the advocacy at the national level uh, for brain change at the, and in the law, but also in the practice of uh, at the local level for land land access to to the women. Thank you, thank you very, thank you very much, and, and we wish you. Uh, great success at the national level advocacy. Um, hey, one of our participants. I would, want, I would want to respond to the second question on capacity building. Please do, please do. Okay, thank you. Um, for us uh, in the Tamale project, we have undertaken a series of capacity building exercises, both at the community level and bringing people other stakeholders around the issues of land rights to sensitize them on the current land laws. Uh, recently, we had a regional consultative meeting where we shared the new uh, gender provisions that we wanted to be included in our new land bill. Our new land bill, um, we're trying to get uh, some of the provisions inside that to be, so that the bill can be very sensitive to the issues of women's uh, land rights. We brought these communities together. We shared these things with them. We, make sure, we always make sure that they understand the issues of land rights because land rights, issues around land has been shrouded in some kind of secrecy. So many people don't take the trouble to even know what their rights are even within the community. How can the community participate within a particular land transaction. Sometimes they don't even know 
that that is even the space that they will need to make their voices heard. And so when we did, the, when we had the last uh, uh, capacity training on the land, the current land bill that we are trying to include certain gender sensitive provisions into, we also made them aware of their positions as community members, what their opportunities are within the community that they can use to get their voices heard uh, during those, those meetings. And it was quite lively. We used other, other uh, methods such as the drama, and we made them to identify their own themes that uh, sort of uh, make it difficult for women to be included in land decisions. And they set up their own uh, skits, which they acted upon, and they, made, they took their own decisions, seeing the, the outcomes of what was happening in the drama that they themselves were, were undertaking. They made resolutions, and when they go back, this is what they were going to do, because either two, they did not understand that they even had a place within the community to make their voices heard. Because communities also have a role when it comes to issues of large-scale land-based investments, which is taking away most of the prime lands at our community level for uh, commercial agriculture, virtually getting the women out of the system with no compensation whatsoever. Now, we, during this training, we have made them to understand that they can seek redress for the destruction of their crops, for um, the taking away of their livelihoods. And so they will also need to be compensated. Usually when the compensation comes, it ends at the traditional council. So it means that it's only the chief and his elders that uh, benefit from the, from the compensation. The woman who is utilizing that piece of land and has invested over a long period of time on that piece of land, and working and cultivating on, uh, on the piece of land, does not benefit from any compensation. And so that capacity building built on several things other than the land rights or the laws that protected uh, land, roads, land, land rights for both men and women at the community level. Thank you. Thank you, Patti. Uh are there other experiences from, from Senegal or from, or from Tanzania in terms of um, the, the impact that capacity building can have in terms of identifying and strengthening uh, women's voices in land governments? Yeah, uh, in Senegal we are, the, the major impact of capacity building is um, improvement of leadership. Now uh, with a space of dialogue creating and the Several conversation setting by with um, between the women and the, and the elected council. There are fostering to discuss with them and to to improve their concern to the to the decision maker. So they have the, now the possibility to to address uh, some key challenge regarding the land issue. So now we we try to to understand several things to question the different process in the decision making process but also to to struggle with the different challenge at the, at the local level so it is a, a relevant change, change that we are noted during the the period of implementation and now i think even if we stop to 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 work at the local level we start to note some change uh, regarding the leadership of, of women on land issues. And, and from Ghana, do you have do you have a, an example of capacity building um, to identify local solutions, Neri? Oh, on our part in Tanzania, uh, we, we, uh, our, our program was not de developed. We, we, we didn't have a very specific capacity building sessions, but through the dialogues, uh, in a way, it, 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 is, it, is, it, it was a part of building the capacity of the local communities and the village council. And as I mentioned earlier that uh, now women and men have demonstrated an increased knowledge and understanding of uh, of land governance, and uh, we we uh, this was cemented by the ward executive officer of one of the villages we we, we worked uh, uh, in Kisarawe, and uh, he said that the community conversations uh, with uh, town officers and uh, district solicitors 
uh, in the process of adopting the bylaws has played a major role in equipping uh, the local community and the village council with the knowledge related to uh, to 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 uh, land governance and uh, women and women land rights. So we 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 have also some some of the impact which we can really say we uh, uh, has come out of this uh, initiative. Thank you, thank you, Mary. Thank you. A very rich set of experiences we have around this around this webinar table. I, I'm now going to pass on to um, Philippine, who would like to say some concluding remarks. Um, before I do, as this will be the last you'll hear from me, can I thank Mary, Fati, and, and Mamadou for enriching this webinar? Um, I've certainly learnt learnt a lot from lis listening to you, and I shall be following up with each of you. That, um, later on, and can I thank those that have um, participated? Um, and uh, I just now hand over to to, to Philippine to, to conclude this. Thank you very much. Thanks, Simon, and uh, and thanks again to all participants uh, and presenters uh, for um, for the work. Um, just to conclude, I, I, mean, I wanted to mention that the project is, is coming to an end and in the past few months we've been working on a few uh, publications including a research report which will share um, each in-country work and sort of identify common lessons and, and learning. Um, there will be also, also a, a long read which will be uh, published on the, uh, on the IID website. So, just to say, please, please stay tuned if you want to uh, to know more about uh, about this project. And thanks again, all.